Hi, welcome to this Hangout on Air that we're doing live from Rework. My name is Puni Ahira, and I am the program lead for Solve4x, which is a program run by, out of Google X. And with me, I have Nikita Johnson, who is going to tell us a little bit about what the Rework conference was all about today. Um, and then we'll go to our Solve4x panelists who presented earlier this morning. OK. Um, so my name is Nikita. I'm the founder of Rework. So Rework is all about combining emerging science, technology, and entrepreneurship to try and solve big global problems. So we've just finished a day um, at the Rework Technology Summit where we had speakers um, looking at and exploring topics um, including synthetic biology, um, 3D printing, self-assembly, robotics, um, biotech, so lots of different emerging and advancing technologies. Um, so yeah, it's been a really good day, and now we're finishing it with this Google Hangout. Thank you again so much for having us. Um, I just want to introduce our panelists who are going to be taking questions um, with this group of SolveRx community members. Um, so on the far left is Skylar Tibbetts, um, and I'm going to let each of them give a little bit about their background and what they're working on. Uh, in the middle, we've got Bruce Schell, and uh, on the far right, we've got Rachel Armstrong. So Skylar, if you want to start off and, and give a little bit of background of where you come from um, and what you spoke about today in, in maybe a minute or two. Sure. Uh, I have a background in architecture and computer science. And I run a research lab at MIT called the Self-Assembly Lab. I spoke today about our research on self-assembly and programmable materials uh, and how it, it's a new picture for how we assemble things in the industrial space. So construction, manufacturing, assemble, assembly lines, productization, that sort of space. Uh, Bruce, do you want to go next and then Rachel? Yeah. Um, my background is in aviation um, and manufacturing, so uh, rather random things. And I got into a couple of years ago mobile robotics and more, I guess, precisely uh, the desire to take factory level automation and mobilize it so that it could be used in outdoor spaces and on outdoor infrastructure. So taking the outside, uh, the inside automation that, that they use in a factory and applying that to the outside world. And I'm Rachel Armstrong. I have a background in medicine. I was a medical doctor and I've worked across disciplines with architecture and design since I was a medical student. Um, and currently I'm a School of Architecture as co-director of um, Avatar, which is the Advanced Virtual Technological Architectural Research Group. And um, I'm studying um, lifelike materials and applying lifelike technologies to grand challenges. So for example, currently I'm working on things like uh, a living city, where a city literally embodies the processes of life, um, and also the design and engineering of a living interior to a world ship. Um, and that's a project called Persephone. Amazing. Um, so in addition to the people that you see in the Hangout, we also have um, quite a few members of our community who have also joined in, and they're using the new questions app to ask questions live. Um, so in addition to the live questions, we've also um, got this coming through this feed, which I will take um, as we, we carry on the conversation. Um, but to start with, uh, I'll hand it over to Tina and Ben, who actually attended some of the conference today um, for follow-up questions that you had after listening in on the presentations from these three. Hey guys, um, I'm Ben. And I'm, I'm Tina. Sorry. Uh, I'm doing a PhD at Imperial College um, in sort of uh, hard material protein interfaces. Um, and I co-founded a company that makes microfluidics for life scientists. Um, my question for you, Skylar, is um, what does uh, what does sort of um, chaperone proteins or, or catalysts look like in, in self-assembling materials? Yeah, it's a good point, and, and I, I think you had mentioned something earlier, um, earlier today about that. And we've thought about it, but haven't implemented anything um, like the catalyst. But, but one way to think about it is um, other structures in the environment or other let's say, inputs in the environment that can help it get from point A to point B. Um, I think there's kind of like the salad bowl example um, that, that other people have referenced that could help it make this dodecahedron structure. So it's, it's sort of like self-assembling in other structures, and those catalysts could also self-assemble. But we can also look at it as the chamber. In a lot of our examples, we have some type of enclosure that it's in. 
And the shape of that chamber helps or hurts the assembly process uh, and how fast it can be, let's say. So in some ways, that also acts as a catalyst. Sure, thank you. Oh, OK. Hello. <laughs> I'm Tina. Um, my background is chemical engineering, although I actually work in business now. Um, my questions, I mean, first of all, I think that all three of you are very inspiring. And one of the things I was thinking of when I actually saw the three of you present is actually a lot of the work that you do has lots of potential for overlap. Um, and two things came to mind. One is that the level of specialism and knowledge required to work in your spaces to continue to develop the thinking. And also, how do you cross-pollinate that between, for instance, Rachel, what you do, and some of what Skylar presented in terms of how, you, how do you use that within the architecture of, of the world in 20 years' time? Um, so I guess, um, you know, one of my questions to you, Rachel, is, you, you've moved from medicine into architecture for living cities. Mm -hmm. How do you see what you've today as a way to progress your thinking, and what, what are the links that you're going to take away to explore further? I, 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 I think this is a really interesting question about um, multidisciplinary method. Yes. Uh, and I think one of the, the my own adventures, and to, to get me to this point, so I can ask you uh, answer your question, is that um, I've just you know written a PhD that's not coming from science, and that was extremely challenging because I realised that actually there's this, there's a, there's a huge difference between the arts and science, and it's not what you think it is, and it's actually an exploration of method. Science assumes a method. So a scientific method, um, when you write it up, would be something like you take the beaker, you put it on the bench, you add 500 milliliters of water, you then take another 500 milliliters of olive oil and you pour it carefully down. So you kind of set up method as being literally a set of actions. In arts and humanities, that's not a method. Um, What's a method is actually looking at the philosophy, like whose who's philosophy of beaker are you using? Um, you know, what is the relationship of oil to construction and, and how do you reference that in terms of some kind of cultural context? And so I, I think for me, what I'm looking for from, um, uh, from, from today is, is how do we actually take the rather really interesting cultural insights that, uh, that were coming up, particularly from the audience, about impacts on humanity and trying to investigate um, what the future will hold and, and how do we manage those expectations together with the you know the, the literal technological process and this I guess in some ways quite Cartesian linear thinking even when we start introducing introducing notions of complexity and synthetic biology within that. I think that there's a there's a there's a lovely research field that that then requires almost like an interdisciplinary um, assessment and collaborative um, I, I guess um, immersion in, in, in the issues and so I, I guess I'm very much a, a collaborator so you know heaven for me would be to be able to collaborate with you know Skylar and Bruce for example together with maybe a, a performance artist and you know um, because I, I think you know we would you know share a vision and you know just just jam towards it and and play and experiment so I think one of the key things I've come away from today that this is a, a jamming session uh, the potential for further experiment and cross-disciplinary exchange um, is, is enormous Thank you very much. I think you, uh, there's a lot of uh, points you covered there, but I think what you're saying is the fundamental paradigms and hypotheses used when you start research in a field. I think you're talking about breaking and changing those. I have just one more question, if, if that's okay, we need to, uh, to Bruce. Um, and Bruce, I think this one's a bit more granular, and it's what I was thinking of was you know, if I look at today's themes, one of the themes that's come up is, you know, the ability for, of sensors to exist in our spaces today in a way that they didn't even five years ago, and the ability for us to take the data and make it meaningfully interpretable. And some of the examples you showed today were, um, excuse the background noise, um, some of the examples you shared today were the inspection of a wind turbine, for instance. And I think for me, the, the difficulty always is how do you make the balance between what a machine can do, which is a defined set of deliverables and a defined error that it's looking for, versus what a human eye can do, and how do you, um, how do you design for that? <coughs> um, 
Well, I think it's I think it's key in that part of the design that that the you have to get past what the sensor, maybe what it was designed to do by asking people that are familiar with a, a human task to have input on what the sensor is looking for. Um, you know, computing power over the last five years, like you say, has has really allowed sensors to to do amazing things. But when you look at a brand new problem, uh, inspecting a, a the side of a ship or a wind blade, like you say, you're you're going to you're going to go out and you're going to find sensors that are probably pretty close to what you want, but because nobody's ever tried to apply them in that particular way, you're going to go out and you're going to find other industry and other professionals to say, you know, okay, how do we do this? Because we're trying to do something fundamentally new with it, but it's similar enough that it can be tweaked. The algorithms can be tweaked or the, you know, maybe there's still some human interaction on the back end and as what you've created becomes more understood, the algorithms will be changed and the automation can take place. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we've got a question from the audience. Uh, this is Megan Lyons um, and she, her question is for Skylar. Um, she says, is your self-assembly research founded in biomimicry? Yeah, it's a good question, and I often get asked that. Uh, and biomimicry has become somewhat popular, and a lot of, a lot of people are going that direction. I always say no, um, and specifically because biology is a great example, and we're inspired by biology, but inspired by biology, but we're also inspired by many other things that are not biology. Uh, and so for us, it's, it's an example that we look at and we reference. Uh, but I think there's some, some big cautions about trying to scale up one-to-one. -one. And if you just say, okay, this phenomenon happens in biology, so let's just translate it at a, at a huge scale and not think about different materials, different forces, different principles, why you're doing it, or why biology evolved for very, very specific reasons, for very specific constraints. I think it's a bit of a trap. And the other thing is that um, I think biology sometimes becomes an excuse for my project is really good if I use biology. And so I, I'm careful of that. Um, although I think biology is amazing and I'm fascinated by it, I try not to go overboard in the biomimicry side. Cool. Um, uh, Pablo has joined us from Madrid. So I'm going to ask him to tell us a bit about where he's from and what he's doing um, and ask his question. Hi there, guys. It's nice to be here. So I'm from Madrid, and I'm computer engineering, and uh, I'm really interested in all these topics, uh, talking about the future. And I knew Rachel before, and uh, I want to ask her something, but maybe all of you could uh, say something about this. Uh, what I, I want to ask is that uh, some of the projects that I'm interested in, like yours, uh, sounds to be happening like in the future, or sometimes far in the future. But I feel that it's not because the science or technology restrictions, but maybe the context is not ready to really support and understand them. Uh, I want to know if you really feel that way, and or how do you feel about it? I'd be totally down with William Gibson's definition of the future, that it's unevenly distributed. Um, I think that you know, everything that I'm working with, I actually know scientists that are developing the technologies. And your observation about cultural context and even you know, infrastructure, um, economic circumstances, the kinds of support the government gives to research grants, um, you know, economic partnerships where businesses may be uh, um, you know, in an economic dip and not giving uh, support to researchers the way that they used to. I mean, all of these impact on what we're actually able to do. And I, I think for me, the, 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 the key really is to, to hold on to a, you know, develop a vision and, and hold on to it because that's the way that we navigate um, through these challenges and find the pathway through which we can start to draw threads together to enable these possibilities to become a reality. So I, I don't see them as being, you know, fictions that are that are in some distant future. I mean, for me, what, what I'm doing is actually happening today. Um, what I need to do is to find the contingencies that enable the research to thrive despite everything else going on. You know, so. Um, uh, 
yeah, so it, essentially it's about, you know, holding on to a vision and finding many different paths to be able to, to realize it and, and trying to inspire people to, to, to join in because once you reach a certain amount of momentum, it's going to happen anyway. You're going to draw the threads together. Cool. And uh, maybe I have another question. Well, I don't know if you guys have something to say about it, but if no, I, I continue with another question. Is uh, I heard you, Rachel, talking about that your approach is maybe not uh, a modern or technological approach uh, compared, for example, to the Venus Project or some, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, I think that uh, maybe in the future the nat nature approach and the technological approach will be um, some point together or will be uh, mm -hmm. the, the same thing. Maybe the technological part could help the uh, nature. I don't know if you feel that way. I, to I totally agree with that statement. I think technology, uh, nature is a technology. It's just that it's not until the last 25, 30 years where we've had biotechnological insights and techniques that have been able to help us manipulate the natural world to uh, you know, this, the, the, the atomic scale with such precision that we can really start engaging it with, uh, as a technology. I mean, so for example, you know, a horse was a form of transport you know, for, for in, in a world, you know, b before roads and being able to get around as fast as a horse. Um, and, and so I, I think, you know, it's, it's a, uh, our current definitions of technology are really rooted in the industrial revolutions um, set of ideologies. So we're very you know, machine heavy, but there are all kinds of different technologies. Um, and, and for me, technology is the way that the human mind becomes embodied in the process of problem solving. So that gives us a whole uh, palette of different approaches that we can um, in enact, you know, our interventions. So, it, uh, totally, nature technology, I think that's a really, really interesting thing because it starts to have social consequences. So, if you think of, you know, the political left, what happens when nature and technology become one? That's, that's, a, that's a potentially revolutionary tipping point from a social cultural perspective. Thank you. Um, so next we're going to go to Jason. Jason, if you want to ask your question. Cool. Hi there. Um, so basically, um, I guess this is aimed primarily at Bruce, but feel free to join in for everyone else. Um, so in our current devices and even homes, we're seeing that sensors are becoming more and more uh, prevalent and the number of them are increasing. So this is a three-part question. First of all, what's your favorite uh, sensor within your industry? Uh, what do you think will be the next mainstream sensor? And is there one that doesn't exist that you really wish did? <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, out of the thousands of sensors that exist and all the different things that they do, um, <clears throat> there have been some very high-tech uh, gyroscopes that have, have recently uh, become available. Uh, one would be much like the gyroscope in a Segway, right, that allows the machine to be upright and, and detect small motion. Um, a similar system is used, I believe, in, in quadcopters to keep them level so that you know, a novice can fly them. We use them in our machines as a, a bit of a stability control, right? because when we climb things, we want to make sure that the real robot stays stable. Um, so that's a, that's a really great sensor that, that's, that's out there right now. Um, a sensor that we're we're working on and that I think is really important for all sorts of, of mobile robotics is one that gives finite position control and then you can use that finite position control to affect the motion of the system. So you know you could put that robot in any environment and essentially tell it what to do or it would tell you where it was and it could start to make decisions based on the other sensors that it has, vision and whatnot, to, to map a space or to navigate a space. Um, as far as what would I love to see built, um, I would love to start to see sensors in general built on uh, programming platform or language so that they could be easily integrated together. Um, you know, because as the mobile robotics across the world start to get larger and more and more applications happen, you're going to have to coordinate more and more sensors. So having you know a standard a standard language or a standard controller that could allow them to be very easily integrated uh, and potentially open source could really move things forward quickly. Can I jump in as well? Because I, I have, 
um, uh, I get really excited about natural computing because it's where uh, sensors and effectors can be coupled. So for example, with the uh, droplets that I work with, and I didn't really show a film of these, but essentially they're lifelike droplets. Um, and they can move around an environment, they can sense it, and the thing is that they can produce microstructures. Okay, and these microstructures uh, um, and their form is influenced by the environment. So this gets really cool because now you have a sensor that's coupled to an effector without you having to create a, an external interpretation. Um, so you can literally read the outputs of these droplets by these uh, little skins that they're making. Um, and so, you know, I can see a time. This, this is a kind of soft robotics, but it's using a different kind of program. It's using a distributed program. Its intelligence is distributed. It's not just in the body, it's also in the environment. And the two things are really coupled, and they're coupled at the interface. Um, and so this starts to become a really interesting platform because then, you know, it forms a programmable growth um, and, um, you know, movement actually now start to become possible. So, um, you know, the, the outcome of that is, is really something that, that, that grows and, and then moves in response to other things happening around it. Yeah, the, the three of us uh, today, earlier, had had a very similar conversation about things like self-assembly and, and a living, and almost a living sensor that was part of the environment and being able to couple all of these things up so that the the, the robot, be it you know soft or hard or, or semi-imaginary at the time, can can take in input from the environment and almost seem like it's thinking from itself. I mean, it, it would look it would look like an like an artificial intelligence, but it's it's just grabbing data from so many places, and you know that would move that would move the entire field. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Justin, who has, I believe, is a teacher, and he's just joined us after finishing class. If you want to ask your question. Justin, are you into this? Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> sorry, my, I think my microphone was muted when I came in. Uh, I guess my, my question is, and there's obviously a lot of talk about um, how to get students, whether across a lot of countries, how to get students involved in, in STEM fields and um, looking at where different countries and where we want to be from an economical standpoint. But I guess the question is, um, in, in maybe your opinion, maybe some of the or, or ways to do that, um, both in terms of making some of these newer technologies uh, you know, into the hands of teachers or in schools, in a way that can help them become interested, but both that their skills are more, you know, transferable, or, or what that might look like for um, kind of whether it's getting more students involved in those STEM fields and STEM and interested in their courses at high school or moving on into post secondary, in post secondary, but also um, developing those problem solving skills and you know being curious about you know science and technology. Skylar, do you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah, the the molecular biologist that I work with on a lot of the projects, Arthur Olson. I mean, one of the reason that that he started developing these physical self-assembly models, and then we kind of scaled that up and built a lot more, was primarily for STEM, but also just to build this intuition that physical devices uh, and physical systems have this capability to allow you to understand things very quickly that are not necessarily intuitive, and so. I'm definitely interested in going that direction and finding ways to build physical things that um, gain or have students gain intuition about these phenomena. And I think that has a lot of educational applications. Earlier today, one of the one of the speakers was talking quite a bit about how do they get uh, student interaction, and even at the uh, you know at the elementary school level, right? How do we how do we get people involved and get them concerned? And you know, he started talking about posing posing questions to the students and, and allowing them to have an effect on the outcome. So, uh, for example, what's something around in their environment that they would change that might make a make the environment better? And then implementing some of those things. So, you know, from a very basic fundamental standpoint, allowing people to 
uh, question what is the perceived normal. Um, you know, so when I I've I've always done that. I don't believe in this is how it's been done. I look at something and say inherently, is there some way that I could do it better? And I think probably throughout my life, I was given those opportunities to, to, to make suggestions and to not only succeed, but more importantly, I think, to fail. Um, and I think that that's important. You have to see that you know, there, are, there are real outcomes to the decisions, but the, and that they can, they can help even if they are, if they are a little bit off, because now we've learned something. So I think just allowing the students to really take an active role in what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis can make them inquisitive enough to want to get into fields where, you know, it's not about what's being done, it's about what could you do. And I just want to say I would like to congratulate your students on awesomely psychedelic and rainbow-colored trees that are <laughs> on the wall behind you. They're wonderfully creative. And I guess it um, uh, kind of brings out the point I want to make, which is about STEAM. That I think uh, it's almost an artificial dis division that we, we seem to somehow rather think that art and design is you know, very separate from science and technology. I know that there are people that think they are. Um, to me, that seems a very 20th century way to go thinking about um, the challenges that we're facing um, this, this century. Um, so, you know, I, I agree with both uh, Skyler and Bruce, um, but I think it is a, it's a, we need to take a visionary step towards common challenges, then think about um, how we develop the skill set to go about these. Now, some people are going to be more talented in terms of, you know, the, de the design um, aspects of thinking. You know, they'll be more intuitive, they'll be more explorative, and they won't be kind of so analytical. Um, others will, you know, find a way to um, make contributions by, you know, going to do research and, you know, presenting with a graph and go, this is the future. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's about, um, I guess, getting uh, young people to think in an integrated way, that, 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 so that these that these these subjects aren't so, um, you, you know, like when it's STEM and then you know, it's the arts and humanities, and we don't give a lot of money to them because, I mean, it, essentially, the arts and humanities is, is, is where cultural context, meaning, and, and you know, the, the public buy-in. To, um, the advancement of new technologies actually has you know, weight. In, in the um, Great, thank you, thank you for that. Um, we've had a flood of questions come through from um, the audience who's uh, joined us virtually, um, but given that we are running out of time, I'm going to let the last question go to Martin. Okay, so my last question from the community is um, what was or what will do you think will be the biggest obstacle you have to overcome uh, during the life cycle of your um, project and perhaps uh, a few tips for the community how they can overcome these obstacles. I think um, Thomas Edison at one point said that when opportunity knocks, it's dressed in work or dressed in overalls. It looks a lot like work. <laughs> um, and I think for any disruptive technology, that's the biggest hurdle, right? Because it's it's very easy for us to sit here and say this is the future, and and, and you know we've worked our asses off to bring it to you. Here it is. The kicker is that now that it's here. We have to figure out how do we integrate it, and that's that's not that's not easy, right? You've got a you've got a computer in front of you, and it went from uh, you know Windows Seven to Windows Eight, or which was really bad, or you know if you've got your Mac, it went from you know nine to ten, and there's there's a little bit to learn there, and and it's a pain in the ass, right? So you have to put in the time to to get it any sort of buy-in, and all of these technologies that we're talking about. You know, we can tell you that it's great, and it it could it could be the greatest thing in the world. But if if others aren't willing to put in the work, it doesn't matter what the tech is; the tech will fail. I, I would say that the biggest challenge is either a failure of imagination um, or you know entrenched ways of thinking. And uh, Neil Stevenson wrote a, a, a great essay called uh, Innovation Starvation, where he accused the 20th century of becoming really risk averse. It was quite interesting listening to the last talk of the day, which was Nick Bostrom talking about how we can collapse the risk for all these things that we can take away knives. Um, uh, but you know, that's, that's not the world we're in. And I, I think that the 21st century approach you know, for the community is that we spread the risk. We work together, 
we share the resources, you know, some may have money, other people have talent, you know, and I think working together, spreading risk, um, and, and raising the bar with our vision. We need to get excited about things. If it's a space program, space program. If it's starships, starships. If it's, you know, world peace and harmony, go for it. You know, don't just kind of say, oh, well, I don't think that's possible. So I, I think we have to let go of our 20, uh, 20th century anxieties, just get stuck in there and start believing in ourselves, in each other, um, and think much more long term. This is going to happen. We want it to happen. We can do it. You know, on the, on the long term note, I think from our side, that's one of the biggest challenges is that we are thinking long term and so a lot of the applications take a while and it's hard to scale up. But on the other side there's this paradox that you know everyone's saying okay what are the ap applications, we want to see them do real world stuff, stop being so visionary doing this stuff. <laughs> but then, so then you switch over and you're doing these like game changing, let's say big innovation ideas and, and so it's hard, they, they're asking for real world and then you, you get an interview that's like, okay, we'll paint a picture for five years from now, and 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 different groups want different things. So trying to find that balance of production, but also continually pushing what's possible and like having new ideas and really thinking radically, it's a hard balance. And you know, if you bring in the mix of uh, funding and you bring in the mix of like presentations and workload, not it's it's a difficult balance. And so that's really the challenge is how do you keep maintaining that. Thoughts. Yes, I'd like to add that it's part of the part of the the problem is being asked for the right solution, and I think that you know we can all being on this call, right? We can we can be very grateful to to things like Solve for X that because the world has become so risk adverse, every now and again you need somebody to kind of put it out there and say. What if you know um, really stretch the envelope for us? And you know, with with Google being a, a you know a large multinational corporation, saying you know what, we don't care if it makes money today. We know that if it's a good idea, eventually the money will come. Bring us ideas, and we'll give you some sort of platform to go out and and explain that they're great. So I'd like to you know I'd like to thank Google for having the foresight to say, you know what, big ideas are important, and we're going to give them a space. So well, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate all of the time um, and commitment that you've given to spending all of this day with us and, and staying late for this hangout. Really appreciate all of the questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to get through all of the questions that have come through on the app, but we're going to try and do this more regularly with people that are working on big technological moonshots, and we hope you know, through these conversations We'll be able to encourage and support each other and, and help really accelerate progress in, in an incredible way. So thank you guys again for joining us. Have a great night, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye.